Here ladies and gentlemen, my name is Adrian and I would like to welcome you to my short video lecture on why nitrogen gels phosphate. Or in other words, why NASA drew misleading conclusions and why negatively charged backbone is essential for the stability of nucleic acids. A few years ago there was a science paper published by NASA scientists in which they claimed that they had found a bacterial strain GFHA1 which was apparently able to incorporate arsenic into its metabolism instead of phosphorus if the bacteria were short of phosphorus. They also claimed that arsenic was incorporated into major biomacromolecules, like for example DNA, so that you would have arsenodiester bonds instead of phosphodiester bonds in the backbone of DNA. This is illustrated here in the picture. This would have had very interesting implications. For example, would life-based arsenic instead of phosphorus be possible? Well, in the end it turned out that their experiments were flawed. The buffers were contaminated with phosphorus which enabled the bacteria to grow. No arsenic was incorporated into DNA and even if arsenic was incorporated into the DNA, the arsenodiester bonds would have hydrolyzed way too quickly. We now know that arsenodiester bonds are not suitable for the DNA backbone. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out and in the next few minutes we will learn why this is the case. First of all, I would like to give you a short overview for this video lecture. We will begin with a summary of phosphates in nature, and I will show you some examples and explain their significance. With this in mind, we will discuss what an ester actually looks like, what they are composed of, and how esters are formed. Since this lecture is about phosphates, we will discuss the phosphoric acid and compare its properties to the ones of phosphodiesters. This ultimately leads us to the question why negatively charged backbone is essential for the stability of nucleic acids, and in the end we will explore why arsenic acid is not suitable. To finish off there will be a quiz to test your newly gained understanding. When you take one of your many biochemistry textbooks, you will soon realize that phosphates are ubiquitous in nature. I just wanted to highlight some examples like ATP for the storage of energy, and nucleotides and deoxynucleotides in general as the building blocks of nucleic acids. Also NAD+, or NADP+, are some examples for oxidizing agents in nature. Furthermore, vitamins like thymine pyrophosphate also contain phosphodiesters, just to name a few. A discussion of phosphates in nature would be incomplete if I would neglect the importance of phosphorylation as a post-translational modification. Phosphorylation is nothing else than the formation of a phosphoester between a hydroxy group containing amino acid and a phosphate. Phosphorylation often activates or deactivates an enzyme, therefore regulating its activity. Now, what exactly are esters? Well, I've given you here two examples of an ester. To the left you can see an ester formed by the dehydration reaction of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. To the right you can see the ester formed by the phosphoric acid and an alcohol. However, this distinction between an organic acid like the carboxylic acid and an inorganic acid like the phosphoric acid is somewhat artificial, since both are acids. I just want you to remember that an ester is always formed when an acid and an alcohol undergo a dehydration reaction. Keep this in mind for our further discussions. Let's have a look at the mechanism of the ester formation. The formation of esters in laboratory can be achieved by mixing an acid and an alcohol under acidic conditions. Acidic conditions are necessary to catalyze the formation of the ester and are generated by addition of strong inorganic acid like sulfuric acid. This example here shows the reaction between phosphoric acid and an alcohol. In the first step, the oxygen that is double bonded to the phosphorus is protonated. This renders the attached phosphorus more electrophilic and facilitates the attack of the nucleophile, in our case the alcohol. The next step is a proton transfer in the pentavalent intermediate. Now water will be eliminated to give the protonated species on the bottom. After deprotonation, the phosphoester and water are obtained. 
These reactions are all equilibrium reactions and the only way to drive this reaction forward to the products is by adding the reagents in excess or by depleting the equilibrium of water. Interesting. So why do nucleic acids not spontaneously hydrolyze in an aqueous environment? We'll come to that later. Now we need to discuss the properties of phosphoric acid. Here you can see the three pKa's of phosphoric acid. The pKa increases for every third deprotonation step with a magnitude of 5. This can be explained by the fact that every deprotonation step adds a negative charge and each additional negative charge makes the molecule less favorable in terms of charge repulsion. It is clear that under physiological conditions at least the first deprotonation step will have occurred. But which of these species corresponds to the situation in a phosphodiester? Is it the one where all deprotonation steps have taken place? And if so, would there be a negative charge on the phosphodiester since the last deprotonation step has a pKa of approximately 12.7? Well, it turns out that phosphoester and phosphodiester have a pKa around 2. In case of the phosphoester, this is true for the first deprotonation step. This confirms that there must be an active charge on the phosphodiester backbone of nucleic acids, or at least this is the case under physiological conditions, which are around pH 7.4 in cells. Well, now we have confirmed the negatively charged backbone. But I have told you before that many negative charges on a molecule will repel each other, and therefore destabilize a molecule. Isn't this also the case with DNA? Haha! <laughs> Nature is very clever and has a way to resolve this seemingly paradoxical problem. Divalent metal ions like, for example, magnesium 2 plus will align with the backbone and shield the negative charges from each other. Cool! Now I have seen that the negative charge does not destabilize the DNA backbone. But how does it actually stabilize the DNA? Think of it this way. Hydrolysis of the phosphodiester bond starts with a nucleophilic attack of water on phosphorus. Water can act as a nucleophile since it has two lone pairs. Lone pairs consist of two electrons and therefore will be repelled by negative charge. At pH 7, a protonation step to facilitate nucleophilic attack is very unlikely. Furthermore, if you try to draw a nucleophilic attack, you can count negative charges on the pentavalent intermediate. How many negative charges are present? Will this be stable? Probably not. On a side note, the half-life time of the phosphodiester bond in water is approximately 30 million years. That is quite impressive, eh? So now we are ready to answer the question why nature does not rely on our xenodiester bonds. If you look up the pKa's of arsenic acid, you will see that they are similar to the ones of phosphoric acid. Nevertheless, as the half-life time of an arsenodiester bond in water with 0.06 seconds extremely short, even though it also carries an active charge. How is this possible? Easy. We can explain this in terms of the periodic table. Arsenic is one below phosphorus and therefore the atomic radius is bigger. It has been suggested that this combined with the longer arsenic oxygen bond makes the arsenic more accessible for nucleophiles and therefore more prone to hydrolysis. We observe that a small difference can account for quite a large change in reactivity. Now with this in mind we arrive at the point where you can test yourself. I have drawn a DNA analog where I substituted the phosphorus with sulfur. What do you think? Will this be more stable than normal DNA? as stable or even less stable. Please also include your reasoning and use the concepts we encountered during this video. I had a great time and I hope you can now appreciate the importance and beauty of phosphates in nature. If you are a die-hard chemistry fan, then I would suggest that you read the great paper Why Nature Chose Phosphates by Mr. Westheimer. It is enlightening and very well written. I'd even say it is a modern classic. Enjoy!